Hello Soundies, welcome to our Sound for Video session. Hope everybody's doing well out there. Today is the 23rd of July, 2023. Great to have you here and great to talk sound for just a little bit here on this Sunday morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are in the world. Um, about my appearance, I did not get in a fight this week. I uh, just had a little trip to the dermatologist. Should be back to normal in the next couple days. So um, I am definitely more of a lover than a fighter. So uh, let's take a look at our agenda here and see what we're going to cover for today. So today we're going to talk a little bit about hardware versus hybrid audio gear. And I'll explain what that means in just a minute here. And then, of course, we have some questions that were submitted ahead of time. We'll check those out. Uh, do our best to answer those, and then we'll head back over to the chat. Um, but before we do that, let me just talk about one thing. We are doing something very different today. Signal chain wise, number one, microphone is the Jay-Z Microphones V11, V standing for vintage. Um, Danny refers to this as my deodorant stick microphone. You can see it has a very distinct profile to it. <laughs> um and then that is going straight into, and thank you, Matt Ruff, for this. Uh, without disconnecting anything, we have the Rode Streamer X here today. So the microphone goes into there. The camera, which is the Canon C70 today, goes into here. It's also a capture card and an audio interface and a mixer and a sound pad. Um, this is all going USB into my computer here, a Mac. And then that's streaming out to YouTube. So that's our signal chain for today. So this is what I would consider hybrid type of gear. Let's just kind of transition into that uh, discussion. So we'll be doing a review here, kind of a, a limited scope review on the Rode Streamer X, uh, probably next Sunday, depending, you know, assuming we don't run into any issues. We've just, this, I wanted to use it for a stream so I could have that experience. And then we will be in a good position to, to actually review it. And it probably won't be a massive review. The camera functionality, um, we won't probably spend a lot of time on that. But the audio functionality, we definitely will. So this is a hybrid piece of gear. And what I mean by that is that while it has, it's, it's a piece of hardware, um, but to fully use all of its features, you have to run an app on your computer as well. And what's not 100% clear to me I think some of the process, so for example, if you set up a compressor for your microphone to level out the audio levels when you're talking, it's not 100% clear to me. I think there's a digital signal processor in this unit and that the app that you run on your computer is just controlling the settings for that digital signal processor, which is inside the Streamer X, I think. That's definitely how it runs on the... Um, Definitely on the Rodecaster Pro and the Rodecaster Pro 2. Let me just switch over here. I do, um, in full disclosure, I do have another <laughs> another computer over here that, we, that I can share the screen on. Let me just bring that up here really quick. Um, so just to kind of run through, I have a separate cap capture card for this just so that it's not confusing to you. There is only basic, there is only one input on the Streamer X. Um, and it, it fills a specific use case. But if you look at these pro products here, so the Rodecaster Pro 2, um, the Rodecaster Pro 2, there was an interesting video that Rode posted recently where they actually talked to their, their head engineer and they actually took the Rodecaster Pro 2 apart. If you haven't seen it, it's a really fascinating, it's kind of long, but it's a fascinating video. In essence, the Rodecaster Pro 2 is a computer that runs the Linux operating system but instead of having a keyboard and a traditional computer screen, it has this, it's, it's a highly customized version of Linux, if you will. And it has dedicated hardware specific for the purposes of mixing audio for a, a podcast or a live stream or, or things like that. And the same with the inputs and outputs on it. So it's, um, that I would say in terms of the overall, you know, spectrum of hardware versus hybrid, I would say... The Rodecaster Pro 2, and, and there, there are a couple of different dimensions here. I should I should mention that. There's analog gear versus digital gear. So when we talk about analog gear, let me just show you what I'm talking about here. Here, a great example of that, or yeah, analog gear is a DBX286S. 
most microphones that have XLR outputs, with the exception of some of the newest ones, are purely analog devices. They are they're pure hardware. There's no software needed to make them run. You just plug them into another device, which can then preamplify them. Or in this case, with the DBX, it is a preamplifier. It does not have any sort of digital output. It is an analog output. Um, so this is definitely on the the far end of the spectrum as far as hardware is concerned, and it's it's the analog gear. You can see uh, there are lots of different options here, lots of different examples. This is the Shelford channel, which I've used on my live stream in many cases in the past. It's a preamplifier with an equalizer, a compressor, and a saturator all in one. It Its input is just you you connect a microphone to it, and then its output is an analog output, which you then send to a mixer or a camera. We, we actually sent it to our camera in the past. So that's one end of the spectrum. And then over here on these hybrid devices, you can see, for example, the Streamer X is a hybrid device. And I call it that specifically because you plug it into your computer via USB. And the only way you can control some of its features are by running an app on that computer that you've connected it to. Um, some other examples of that here, actually, on the road site, we'll just we'll uh, use Rode as, an, as for examples here. Let's go ahead and view the microphones they offer. Their most recent microphones, interestingly, there's the Pod Mic USB. So you connect that to your computer via USB. So it is obviously a piece of hardware, but I would call this more of a hybrid microphone because it does have some processing which you control with via an app on your computer. Same with the NT1 fifth generation. You can actually use that as a plain old XLR microphone into a preamplifier, like you would traditionally, but you can also connect it to your computer via USB, and when you do, you get access to some, digi uh, some digital signal processing, a compressor, and some others as well. Same with the Video Mic Go 2. So all their newer generation, they're starting to build this in, starting with the NT-USB Mini. Um, prior to that, these were all, uh, well, not all of them, but... <laughs> The NT1A, for example, the NT1 fourth generation and before, those were all just purely analog microphones, the broadcaster, the procaster, the even the video mics, the original video mics and the video mic pro plus, and then all of these other microphones prior to that, the NTG3, fantastic microphone, by the way. Um, even some of the newer ones, the Rode TF5s, which are where they where do they have those here? Sorry for all the motion. Um, there they are, the Tony Faulkner Five Small Diaphragm Premium Condenser Microphones for recording. Well, Tony Faulkner mostly records um, <laughs> classical music, uh, strings, and orchestras. Um, in any case, I think you understand the the spectrum there. So there's a there's a spectrum. And some, some devices fit very much on the, this is a purely analog hardware piece of gear versus these hybrid gear. And the hybrid gear is becoming more and more common, it seems like. So the Streamer X is a great example of that. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to each of those. And I just wanted to run through some of those ideas just so that um, when you're making decisions about how you're going to set something up for a particular job that you're doing, a project, then you have some good ideas of kind of what the pros and the cons are to each of them. So hybrid devices have some pretty significant upsides, some, some pros, if you will. Oftentimes they are upgradable via firmware or they have associated software apps that can run on a computer to, to give them additional functionality. They're often less expensive in light of the number of features that you get. So you can often get a lot more features there um, for a lot less cost. And then it, it does often on the, I guess on the, maybe on the downside, it does often require a computer or a mobile device to take advantage of those additional features. So it's essentially spreading out the cost of your investment. So if you already have a computer and you already have a mobile, um, rather than buying a piece of hardware that has to do all those things as well, potentially, uh, you just connect it to your computer or your mobile and take advantage of that. So those are some of the advantages there, but if we take a look at purely hardware solutions, there are some advantages that I think some people don't always account for. And I think first of all, and I have a bias, I will, I'm gonna be crystal clear here before we jump into those, I am biased. <laughs> I would almost always prefer to have a hardware solution and 
Not a hundred percent. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a Luddite in terms of, I don't, it, I, I like technology. I, I think technology is fantastic, but when I am doing a job professionally, sometimes I just want a hardware solution because it simplifies some things. And let me explain what I mean by that. First of all, not always. And that's why there's an asterisk here. Oftentimes a piece of hardware is less likely to crash. It's not running an operating system. It's not running an app. Um, or if it is, it's a very dedicated piece of code that's running on firmware or even on, on, on something more permanent than that. So generally, it's less likely to crash. I say that it's easier to troubleshoot. That's, again, not universal, but a lot of times it's easier to troubleshoot if your overall signal chain for whatever you're doing, if it's just audio, if you have pieces of hardware that are connected to each other, it's a little easier to figure out where the problem lies because you can start at the start and work your way through step by step by step until you figure out where the problem is. As soon as you get software involved, that gets a lot more complicated because with software, it's often a black box. You can't see inside of everything and that can make things a little bit more challenging. So it's, um, it's important to keep that in mind. It is usually hardware is, is dedicated to a very specific task or set of tasks. So for example, if we go back and we take a look at the, the DBX286 again, if I pull that back up here, um, there it is. So for those that are not familiar with this, this is a channel strip or what's often called a channel strip or a channel. And you plug the microphone, an XLR microphone, there's a, an input on the back. The first knob is a preamplifier. The second set of knobs is your compressor. After that, you have a couple of other processors. I'm not gonna go through all the, the gory details, but the, a similar type thing again with the Shelford channel. I wish I could make that bigger. Maybe if I go, no, it's not, it's just not, it doesn't wanna do it today. Um, but a similar type of things. These first few knobs here are the preamplifier and the amount of gain, and there's a trim there. There's also a high pass filter here, an EQ section, a compressor section, and a saturation and output section. So these do very distinct things. They they have a very limited set of things that they do. And they they do them, they generally do them really, really well. When they have when you especially have an analog piece of gear, it is designed specifically to achieve the specific things it was built for. And so it has a, a tendency to, to be pretty good at it, first of all, and secondly, um, to not have a lot of issues in terms of crashing and things like that. Now, I don't want to. This is not universal. There, there are, there are issues that arrive with analog, uh, that arise with analog gear. They do fail at times. Um, are they always easier to troubleshoot? Generally, because you don't have as many settings, first of all, and the settings are usually knobs, um, so it's a little bit more straightforward. Um, and they usually are just, uh, they're doing a very limited number of tasks. So those are just some thoughts that I wanted to share with you really quickly. I've been thinking a lot about that lately. And some people have, um, what I find, for example, is I was working with the Rodecaster Pro 2 and I have a very specific way I like to set my live streams up and it doesn't actually probably match what most people do. So what I mean by that specifically is that and I think the Streamer X is a great example of that. The Streamer X is a product that is really aimed at gaming streamers. I think that's very, Rose's been pretty clear about that. that's their, their target market. Although it can be for business meetings as well if you're giving a presentation. It's got some nice features for that as well. But its its main role is for gaming streamers because, and you can tell by the way they've set it up. So you have one microphone input you have one HDMI input. It's a really nice one, by the way. It's a 4K um, input. And it has a pass-through, uh, an HDMI pass-through. So in essence, what you would do is you would connect your gaming rig, whatever that is, up to the Streamer X and the input. You do a pass-through to a monitor so you can actually see yourself playing the game. <laughs> um, and then you would connect this to your computer that you're streaming with. And that's how you can get the gaming video into your stream and the audio into your stream. It has some pads to play back sound effects or music, which was what we used to play back the intro music here. Um, you've got uh, you can very, you've got two buttons. You can very quickly mute the microphone like this, 
And you can also turn off the video very quickly like that um, with a dedicated button. So um, it's got a headphone knob with a headphone jack. You can also uh, use a wireless go to transmitter and the Streamer X will receive it. So if you wanted to do it wirelessly, you can do that. So it's a neat, it's a neat product. Um, it does a lot of interesting things, but it's made for a pretty uh, specific market of people. And there is an app as well called Unify. It's only in beta right now on Mac. I'm running on Mac. Um, so we'll probably talk about that a little bit in the review that we do next week. But there is uh, kind of the first set of thoughts about using hardware. Now, oh, actually back to the topic of hardware versus hybrid. When I can, I like to use hardware. Um, here's a, here was a, here's a hint, like for example, the switcher that I typically use for my live streams is an A10 mini extreme ISO. So it's an eight HDMI input. It has two unbalanced stereo 3.5 millimeter audio inputs, which um, if I'm using something like a Shelford channel, that's not a great option. <laughs> and so for that reason, I send the audio to my camera, which has a balanced input. Now, a lot of streamers don't have that. They're actually generally working with cameras that either have 3.5 millimeter inputs or webcams. So um, I realize that, that that puts me in a very kind of corner case kind of situation already. Um, but that's that's how I like to do it. And what it, what it means for me as well is that when I... For example, when I'm using the Mackie DLZ Creator as my audio mixer, the beautiful thing about that is it has two uh, monitor outputs, monitor slash line outputs. They're true line level, professional line level. So I can send those directly to my cameras, balanced mic, uh, balanced mic line inputs, and calibrating the levels between that and the camera, pretty straightforward. And then I don't have to worry about the audio being in sync with the video. And I send the HDMI output from the camera into the switcher, and I'm set to go. And even when I switch to other HDMI sources with the A10 Mini, I can still keep the audio coming from the camera. So it's not an issue um, from that standpoint. So it's a pretty nice setup. It works. Um, not everybody does it that way, but that's that's one way I like to do it. I like to have... I like hardware or hybrid products that give you enough physical controls, because what I hate doing... <laughs> let me let me take that back. I don't generally prefer to use a computer app to control a whole bunch of different things at the same time. So for example, today we're using OBS on this computer because we're sending the video or the videos coming in from the Streamer X into a computer via USB. I have a separate capture card to get this other laptop where I'm showing the slides here. And then I'm using OBS to cap to put all that together and stream it out to YouTube. It's my encoding app. Um, typically, I use uh, a hardware encoder too when I can. Um, and the reason for that is that it becomes it becomes I think unwieldy to try and control a whole bunch of different devices on the same computer. Now, yeah, you can have lots of different monitors, and that makes it easier. But it's just a that, that's, that's just my bias, so <laughs> that's how I generally prefer to do things. And when we do it professionally, um, for example, for our conference that we do each year, and actually that reminds me of one other thing I wanted to cover here, um, we have a team that actually comes in. So they've got people dedicated to different purposes. So they have a technical director that's making the call on which cameras to switch to in real time. We have someone operating the control surface for the switcher. We have another person that's helping the remote cameras out there at giving them instructions and in what to do for, for what they're doing. Excuse me, just a second. I need to clear the voice here. So when you have that, it makes it a little easier when each of them have their own control surface and their own very specific role of what they're doing. Any motion graphics, there's another person generating those and communicating to the person operating the switcher hey, we have this ready. I've put it into slot number three in the media player um, just so that the switcher has that information and is, is able to bring those overlays up, things like that. So in any case, um, those, are some, those are some considerations there. So let's take a look at the chat here and see what's going on out in the chat. I don't have the overlay today, so I don't have the ability to put the chat uh, notes up on the screen. 
but uh, it's good to good to have you all here. Thanks for everybody joining. All right, let's see. Got oh Matt, Matt's here. Matt, thanks again for letting me borrow the Streamer X. Um, it's a four hundred dollar device. I was tempted to buy one, and then I thought, well, <laughs> I've got so many other devices out here. I don't really need it, um, but I loved I'd love to re review it. And so he was kind enough to um, lend that to me. So thank you for that, Matt. All right. Let's see what else we've got here. Um, Synergy, your sound, your vision says, if you want to check if the computer is used for processing some of the settings, you can open activity monitor found in the utilities folder of your Mac. Yes, good point there. I'm pretty sure it's not. I'm pretty sure that the, the signal processing is taking place in the streamer X, but yes, I can check that and I appreciate that. That's a good point. All right. Uh, Matt says it's the same uh, with a wired solution versus wireless. The wired connect connection is usually usually works or it doesn't. With wireless, it can go just go south at any time for no reason <laughs> or no apparent reason, at least. Yes, that's a great point. Uh, case in point, Mark Holloway says um, this morning we have real problems with comms all wireless and worked out the issue just before going live. Yeah, so there's some challenges there. Wireless is another great example of that. All right. All right, Michael J says, I picked up this unit liking it. I assume you're referring to the Streamer X. And yeah, it's a pretty good little thing. Christopher Wachura says, ATEM would also fall under hybrid. It's also a Linux machine with FPGAs for custom processing. Yes. <clears throat> it is, yeah, that makes sense. I would say it is probably. And again, there's a spectrum there. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is having, I really like having physical control. So for example, with a mixer, let's use the ATEM as an example. If I have to use the software mixer to move faders, I can use, I can move, we talked about this on a live stream a while ago. I can move one fader at a time with a mouse. I can't move two at a time. If I'm on a tablet, then I can potentially, depending on the app, I can move two faders at a time. And what I would mean by that is being able to raise one while you're lowering the other, or boosting several or cutting several at the same time. <clears throat> That's really hard to do uh, on a computer in particular. So, all right, David Martin Graff says, I have a Samson G-Track Pro USB microphone and going live via Yolo, Bro Yolo Box Pro, but have to install the mic into one of the USB inputs, but Yolo treats it as video source. Would a USB to 3.5 millimeter fix this? Excuse me. Well, it should, David. I don't know the particulars of that. I don't know. Does the Samsung G-Track Pro have a 3.5 millimeter output? That, that's one way to get around it. Um, but USB mics, I don't know. The Yellow Box Pro, YOLO Box Pro. I think some people thought I was saying Yellow Box Pro <laughs> before. The YOLO Box Pro. Um, I don't know how it works with USB mics. Um, you might want to contact Yellow Box Pro support to, to get the details on that. But yeah, 3.5 millimeter output. If you have one that's not a headphone output, I would use that. The reason I wouldn't use a headphone output is oftentimes they're a little bit hissier, especially on consumer grade products. A lot of, lot of self noise in there, so it wouldn't be the cleanest necessarily. All right. Uh, Vihar says, your voice sounds good with this microphone. Thank you. This is one of my favorite microphones, despite the fact that Danny refers to it as the deodorant stick microphone. I do I do think it sounds <laughs> pretty nice. Uh, Matt says, the reason I got the streamer was, is since I retired, I sold the ATEM and the Rode has a good preamp, XLR, and excellent HDMI capture all in one. Totally makes sense. It's a great device for that. I'm actually pretty impressed with it so far. Michael J says, I use two PCs and uh, uses vmix um, so that makes a lot more sense as well uh emil says what devices are we using mackie no today we're using the rode x streamer x which has a microphone input and a hdmi input so the camera's coming into that this microphone's coming into the streamer x 
Those are connected via USB to my computer and we're streaming out via OBS. So that's what we're talking about today. No, no Mackie mixer or anything else. Okay. Uh, Christopher says, my guess is Rode is using the same FPGA. And for those that aren't aware uh, or familiar with this concept or this term FPGA, it's a field programmable gate array. It's essentially a, it's basically a processor that can be updated with firmware, I think is maybe one way to put it. Um, but they're using, uh, Rode is, Christopher says, Rode is using the same FPGA code they developed across all their platform to get more reuse out of the intellectual property. So StreamerX would process in hardware, but control is from the computer. That makes sense. Um, Christopher Wachura also says for, um, for your question earlier, let's see here. Why am I not able to scroll? For the question about the G-Track and the yellow box, uh, Aaron Parecki can probably help answer that. Um, he has a bunch of videos on his channel, and also, obviously, YOLO box support would be a good way, too. Okay, let's jump into our questions here that were submitted ahead of time and see what we've got going today. So first up from Robert, uh, I have a four-camera shoot of a live music performance. I want to use a multi-cam timeline, but audio sync does not work. And just for context, Robert is using DaVinci Resolve here. I've manually synced the tracks using audio. Each track has several clips as I started and stopped the recording. Can I convert these synced four camera plus poly audio tracks to a multicam timeline? Should I make a simple two track multicam timeline, then add the clips one by one doing the manual time align in the multicam timeline? How do you add clips to a multicam timeline? So Robert, yeah, the typically what I would do is the latter. Um, <laughs> you would, I would, I would create a multi cam timeline and then you're going to have to add each additional one if they're not syncing automatically add each additional one manually so that's how i would typically do it and then as far as audio then i would go into the fairlight panel and in there i would mute the ones that i don't need of the audio clips you can hide them as well if you don't if you don't intend to use those so that's generally how i would approach it in davinci resolve so fine question there okay Let's see here. So thanks for that question, Robert. Robert had another one here. I'm recording location sound with my Zoom F6. I need help with what I call front panel workflow at a shoot. How do I solo individual channels while shooting? How do I switch between monitoring headphone and line out mixes? Are there other F6 tasks you do while you are actually recording? Good questions as well. I don't usually use the Zoom F6 for production sound because <laughs> I, it's not the best laid out for that, but you can do it. And the first thing is you go into the channel menus to pre-fade or listen or, and, and solo that particular input. So that's the way you do that. And then as far as changing between what you're listening to, the little headphone roller on the side of the unit, the right side of the unit, the F6, you push in like a button and that allows you to go to your headphone presets and you can change your headphone presets at that point. So that's how that works at a very high level, Robert. Um, if that doesn't, hopefully that answers your question there. Um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Okay, let's see what we've got here next. Next is from Julian. Uh, Julian is also working in uh, DaVinci Resolve and has a couple questions. First, have you made a video about installing and using the Blackmagic Fairlight sound library? I ask because I'm not sure where to install it, though I am using Windows and realize you are not. And also someone in the past has suggested installing it with its, uh, let's see, installing it with its own separate database, as I mainly use the cloud and network. I wonder whether this had any relevance. I would be most grateful to know how you have it installed, albeit on a Mac, and how you use it. So, uh, for Mac, at least, I don't know how it works on Windows. I assume it's the same. But on Mac, you actually, when you go to install it and you do this right in the Fairlight UI, uh, it downloads an installer app. You run the installer. It puts it wherever it puts it. You can tell it where to put it as well. I would, I would caution against putting it on the cloud or even on a network unless you're using a, like a NAS with a 10 gigabit connection to the network attached storage. Uh, otherwise, I would just install it on your local computer because when it comes to monitoring and playing back, you're going to need it fast. So putting it on the cloud is, uh, in 2023 at least, probably not an option 
for 99.99% of cases, unless you have an extraordinarily fast connection to wherever you're putting it on the cloud. So um, the installer should give you a choice on where you want to install it. Um, I just left it at its default location and run it from the computer itself. It's not very big, so it doesn't take up a lot of disk space. Um, just to put your mind at ease about that, if that was a concern. Okay, a second question about DaVinci Resolves. I'm struggling to get the video media linked up. So J Julian is taking our course, the new Fairlight mixing course, which we released. I guess it's not that new. It's back in February we released it, uh, Fundamentals of Mixing in Fairlight. And he's trying to get the, the, the project that we bundled with the course set up so he can follow along with it. Um, and the problem is, Julian, is that you're, so I, I put a, an export file of the timeline. It's a .drp file. What you want to do is probably start over, first of all. It looks like you've linked up some proxy um, media, which is, is not, not, this is how I would do it. Uh, start a new project, import the .drp file, and then go into your media bin, highlight everything, right click, and choose relink media, not relink proxy. Then navigate to the file folder where you have all of that stored, and it should be able to find all of those clips, and they should come through okay. So go ahead and give that a try. If that doesn't pan out, email me back, and we'll we'll get it sorted out for you. But uh, hopefully that'll get you where you need to be. All right. Uh, let's go out to the chat here and see what we've got today. All right. Oh, Christopher asks a great question. How fiddly was it, uh, was getting the mic and video in sync on the Streamer X? So it was the same as pretty much every other combination. So if you're bringing audio in through a USB audio interface and you're using a capture card for your camera, so they're coming from two different sources, it's the same, it's the same thing. In uh, OBS Studio, what I do is I hook all of those up, set them up in a scene. So I have the audio source and the video source in a scene. I make a recording right there in OBS, do a clap three times, take a look at, the, uh, bring that recording into a video editing app, a nonlinear editor, go through it frame by frame during the clap sequence and count how many frames off there are, or how many frames difference there is between when you hear the clap and when you see the clap. In this case, it was only two frames. Um, so, what I did is I in in this light in light of the case this case here we're we're streaming at thirty frames per second, so I did the math. Let's do the math right now. Um, switch over to my other computer. So I've taken it out of excuse the slides in the background here. Let's go ahead and pull up our calculator. Um, can we make the calculator bigger? I'd love for it to be a lot bigger. No, I don't see a way to make it bigger, but let's go ahead and do the math. So in a second, there are 1,000 milliseconds. And if I'm filming at 30 frames per second, I'm going to divide by 30. So each frame is 33.3 milliseconds. So in light of the fact that I was off by 2 milliseconds, that may, means I had to add 33.3 times 2, because there are 2 frames. So I had to add 66 or 67 milliseconds. So in OBS... Under the audio configuration, I just applied um, an audio offset of 66 milliseconds. So it delays the audio by 66 milliseconds, and that keeps everything in sync. So that's how we achieved it here. So how fiddly is it? Same as everything else. It doesn't have any sort of hardware facilities for doing the sync on the Streamer X itself. You have to do that within your encoding app instead. So hopefully that, that makes some sense there. Okay, let's see. Bicky Bickford says, question, do you know of a good NDI video mixer? I do not. Um, I have not used NDI, so I don't know of any of those. If anyone else does, uh, please share with Bicky here in the chat. There may be some others on, I think a, a lot of times I think NDI, I don't know if they're dedicated NDI switchers. There must be. Um, some of the Epifan products, I think, can read NDI streams, so they'll, they'll be connected to the, the network via Ethernet and can capture the NDI streams and include those as sources. 
um, but they're not they're not traditional mixers. They're a little bit different. They're kind of an all-in-one encoder, and the bigger unit, the Pearl Two, is a is a is a switcher. Um, but in any case, um, I don't. I, I apologize. That's not my my area of expertise there. David Martin Graf says, how can we split the audio into their dedicated channels? I'll probably need more information, David, on that. In It depends on the context in which you're talking. If you're talking about DaVinci Resolve, um, there is uh, well, there's a whole section in... There's 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 routing. There, there it's just yeah. We need more context. If you have a little bit more context and where you're trying to do that, um, let me know and we can talk about that in a little more detail. Michael J still use A10 Mini Pro for cameras and they use X for the screen capture. Find its screen capture very good. Yeah, it seems like a nice combination there. Oh, and Matt does have some information for Bicky there using a Trickster. Um, Tricaster. Okay. <laughs> TriCaster makes a lot more sense. So TriCaster. So TriCaster, by the way, is, if I understand correctly, is basically a dedicated computer with um, with HDMI inputs on it. So, um, all right, all right. Robert says thanks. I was hoping for a shortcut to solo a channel. Yeah, just going into the channel menu for that channel is is the way you do it. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, Mark is looking for a simple, very small fader for mix pre. I know about the approved ones, but are very large. Uh, well, that's the thing is I think that the compatibility is built into the mix pre firmware. So I think as far as I'm aware, there aren't any that are smaller that work with the mix pre. So I don't know if there is a, another option there. I don't know if anyone else has experience with that. I've just used the, what was the one I used? I had made a video about it years ago. Um, and I don't, don't use it very often. Um, in fact, Emma has it down at her place. <laughs> so I haven't touched it in years. Um, but I think it's a launch pad. The launch pad XL is the name of the product and who makes that novation, I think. Um, but anyway, all right. All right. David Mark Grath says, I meant the audio of speaking, scenery, special effects. Okay. So in our DaVinci Resolve course, we cover that. So in essence, what I do is uh, each person for, for a scene, for example, each person, each actor has their own track for dialogue, at least one. And sometimes we will also have a boom track and a, and a lavalier track. Um, Anything that is uh, ambient, we actually typically call it ambiance um, instead of scenery, but any ambient sound will go on its own tracks as well. So if I have multiple ambiences, each of them will have their own track. Any sort of um, sound design effects, anything along those lines, they'll each be on their own track. And we'll actually usually put those in groups as well. So we'll either put them on a bus um, or you can actually use mixed groups as well, which is a new feature in DaVinci Resolve 18.5. Um, we have not covered that, but uh, buses are another way that I've typically and traditionally done that, is that then I will put all the dialogue on a bus, I'll put all of the ambiances, all the music uh, on its own bus, all the music on its own bus, and then all of the sound design elements on another bus. So I can then have the ability to adjust each of the individual elements, each individual track, but I can also adjust the overall groups or buses um, as one as well. So that's how I typically do it there. Okay, hopefully that makes a little more sense, David. All right, Emil asks, can you use the Unify software with the Rodecaster Pro 2 and Rodecaster Duo without issues? I'd like to add more digital audio channels. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I know that when you when you launch the Unify app, it actually connects specifically to the device. I don't know if you can connect to multiple devices at the same time. You can use Rode Connect to connect multiple devices. So I think that actually may be the direction you wanted to, to look into. I don't know if you can connect to a Rodecaster Pro 2 and a Duo. Um, 
But if you're trying to get all the audio into your computer, I imagine you could. So that's something worth looking into, Emil. I don't know the, the whole answer to that, but that I think it's Road Connect that you're probably more interested in. Matt says, I was a guest on a live stream and didn't have the ability to add delay on the streamer. And as Curtis said, two frames, so it was fine. Yeah, two, two frames, not too bad. Depends on your camera to a large extent. So there we go. Uh, Robert asked a question. Please describe your mic. This microphone right here is the Jay-Z Microphones V11. It's part of their vintage line of microphones. It's a large diaphragm condenser microphone. It's coming into the Streamer X. It does require phantom power. Um, it's quite a looker. Here's its side profile. Again, Danny calls it my deodorant stick. It's shaped like a deodorant stick. <laughs> um, I find it to be one of the most flattering microphones for my particular voice. It does just a really nice job. It fits my voice really beautifully. I frankly was really, I was, I was somewhat disappointed. We did a review of this microphone earlier this year, or was it late last year? I don't remember. I think it was earlier this year. And it got very few views. Um, I don't know if everyone was on vacation that week, but <laughs> it is one of my favorite microphones of all time. And for whatever reason, um, very few other people seemed as interested in, in it as as I was. So that's uh, that's a little bit of information on my microphone there. All right, David asked another question. Would you use three splitter audio into one input where you have the three dedicated lines of your channels recording all at once, ideally with some separation, separate distance. Mm, David, I don't follow that. I'm sorry. Are you talking about con combining three microphones in some fashion? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mark that. It, um, sorry, David, if you could provide a little bit more information, moving on to the next question, Mark Holloway. Yeah. It's the Novation launch control. And I think it's the XL is so it's, yeah, it's not tiny. Um, so it's not a great option if you're looking for something, uh, tiny. All right. Um, Uh, it looks like Synergy, your sound, your vision also has a suggestion there. It looks like there's a vMix v, v desktop switcher that has NDI inputs as well. All right. And then Michael J says, I use the Unify software on two Windows PCs and it works well. Been very stable so far. Excellent. All right. Well, that's everything that's going in the chat. That's everything I had prepared ahead of time. Um, I'm curious if you would tell me, if you wouldn't mind, put your, if you do any live streaming, put your signal chain, uh, your audio signal chain in the chat. I'd be really curious to see what everybody out there is doing, uh, as far as audio signal chains and, also, I mean, include whatever relevant details there are as far as, you know, if you're using a USB audio interface, you know, are you are you then using OBS to stream or how are, how are you putting it all together? How are you bringing it together and getting it into your live stream? I'm curious if over here in the chat you have some information on that. I think it'd be interesting to see how different people are doing it and maybe share ideas and, and see if there are better ways of doing it as well. So... All right. Uh, we also put up a, for those that, oh, a couple things. Oh, I, I, I got to come back to this. Um, I'm going to brag for just a moment. I have a team with which I work at my day job at a company called Webflow. And last, uh, end of 2022, we had our conference, our annual conference, and we put together the opening video for the keynote for that conference. And the opening video was called Superpowers, and uh, we won a gold Telly Award at the uh, for that video, which I was very very excited about. Now, I granted um, Telly Awards, <laughs> just like Oscars or Grammys, are basically an industry patting themselves on the back. Nevertheless, for those that don't work in you know Hollywood and Atlanta sound in the you know the Hollywood film scene, or don't work in the commercial music scene, 
there are the Telly Awards. And um, so we were really, I was, I was really excited that we won that. And if you wanted to see that video, if you just do a search for Webflow Keynote 2022, um, the first five minutes is the video that we put together. And that was actually, that whole video that you'll pull up is, a, it's over an hour long. Um, and it's a live presentation, but the, the first five minutes roughly are the, the, that was the screening of the video that we put together called Superpowers. So pretty excited about that. Um, I, my brother has, uh, Carrie has always joked about being an award-winning filmmaker. Um, he said, Curtis, you're not an award-winning winning filmmaker like I am. And now we're both award-winning filmmakers. Um, so, <laughs> all right. We have a couple of other items here in the chat here. All right. Michael J says deodorant stick. Call him the Mitchum man. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I love the mic regardless of what uh, anyone calls it. Still like it. All right. Curtis, uh, this is from Bartek. Uh, Curtis, do you think the Streamer X will be better solution for capturing video or would you use a 10 mini plus separate audio interface? Um, either way you can make it work. Um, this, I need to look into this, but from the initial looking I did at the Streamer X, there's no way to change the input, the XLR input to line level. It's either microphone or instrument. I need to look into that more, but if there's no line level setting, then for me, it wouldn't be a, a great option um, because I'd want to mix multiple sources from um, in another mixer first, like a DLZ Creator or a Rodecaster Pro 2 or some other mixer, my my SQ5, um, before I send it into the device, it's going to convert it and send it to the computer or, or whatever we're doing. Also, in my case, I'm not using a software encoder. So again, my bias is showing through. Well, that's not 100% true. <laughs> the hardware device that I use to encode and send my stream to YouTube each week is an Epifan Pearl Nano. It is basically a PC in a little metal box running a opt, uh, you know, a very specialized, customized operating system. Um, so it's software at some level, but it's a dedicated device. Its only job in that signal chain for me is to encode the video and send it to YouTube. That's all it does. So, um, but yeah, I think it could be a fine choice, especially if you just need one microphone. If you need more than one microphone, I'm not sure it's the best device for that. Um, so it's pretty special purpose. There may, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a Streamer X Extreme at some point that has multiple microphone inputs and, and multiple HDMI inputs at some point. Because if the noise that I've heard around the Streamer X is any indication, I think they've sold a good, a decent number of these. So I think they're probably going to be pretty enthusiastic about getting into that part of the market and in, in, in with with more products. That's my guess. I don't really know. I don't have any, any inside information on that. But um, so to answer your question, Bartek, I think I personally would stick with an A10 Mini um, and a separate audio interface if you're using a software encoder on your computer. All right, David says, yes, if you had two speakers, they would have their own channel, but also like at a sports game, the crowd would have a channel. So two Rode Wireless Go devices. Okay. Um, yeah, I would not, I mean, I, you're going to need a mixer of some sort. So a mixer to bring them all together and to balance out their levels is what you'll need there. Okay. Uh, Emil, how easy do you find processing on Streamer X compared to other uh, to the other roadcasters? Pretty much the same. The controls are all the same. Um, yeah, the Unify app makes it easy. There's um, yeah, it's all it's all it's good. <laughs> uh, the visuals are pretty good, and this is again this is a beta version on Mac, um, but I think it's pretty good. I'm not having any issues with it. Um, the compressor, uh, the compressor visualizations, uh, hopefully they get a little bit better, but um, sorry, I can't show you this. I'm not sharing this screen. I'm just sharing that screen, but um, that we'll, we'll cover it in our, in our review video a little bit more. All right. All right. Uh, oh, here's some, some info on people's signal chains. So Michael J is using an ID44. AudioFuse Studio, ATEM Mini Pro, 
and vmix it looks like okay very good mark says that i'm too scared to do live streaming yet <laughs> i will just say this mark i understand the perspective i would say this doing live sound is an incredible way to improve your chops uh your your audio engineering chops i highly recommend it start where it's low risk um but yeah it's there's nothing else like it so uh bartek says i he's using an sm7b and re20 to a roadcaster pro 2 and for video a canon r5 into an, an atomos and then to an atem extreme okay so again an atem and a roadcaster basically along with your microphones cool uh, let's see here. Oh, scrolling, scrolling. Okay, more, more. Oh, it really, whoa, we got a bunch here. Want to see that we got these. Okay, from Woot, uh, MKH, uh, Sennheiser MKH 8040 into an RME U at UCX2 Live Professor Fab Filter Plugin Chain OBS. Okay, very good. So you're doing some live processing on the computer itself. Interesting. Uh, Christopher says, I don't quote live stream, but I am on conference calls 50 to 75% of the week. I use an SM7B to an STM234 Cedar DNS 8D to an Allen and Heath AHM32 mixer to an RME Digiface Dante into the computer. Okay, wow. That's a fancy setup. Looks cool. All right. Uh, Flow H uses a T Bone SC400 and a Lessis IO2 Express into uh, OBS Studio. Okay, so pretty simple, straightforward. Um, and the thing is, is that simple, straightforward, you can get great results too, by the way. If it fits your voice, fantastic. All right. Michael is also using a DBX 266S Warm Audio 76 Pre, BLA B173 Mark II Pre, and a is it RNC 1773? So another preamp there, it sounds like. So you've got a bunch of options there, it sounds like, Michael. All right, congrats on the award. Thank you, everybody, for that. Okay, Rag and Bone Puppet Theater is using a Zoom H4N mic and a seven, oh, an A7 IV into a Ninja 5 HDMI recorder. The Ninja 5 goes into the Mac via an Elgato CamLink 4K, and then you're using OBS and out via NDI. Okay, interesting. Cool. Cool, cool. So there you're going with the... Um, using a Zoom H4n into the Sony Alpha A7 IV. Cool. Just uh, just super curious here what and synergy your sound your vision all audio into a Midas DL16 Midas M32 Live R into an ATEM 4K or ATEM 2ME Constellation HD into Live U Pro or Teradec Video Go. Cool. That's a pretty pro level setup there. It sounds like you're using some, some mixers, some some dedicated live sound mixers into some um, kind of the more traditional switchers, the bigger switchers with a lot of capabilities. Matt Ruff is using an audio signal chain as simple. It's an Earthworks USB Icon Mini, uh, the Streamer X, the one that I'm using. So I need to get that back to you. <laughs> and then the Rode Procaster mic. Very good. Again, simple. When you, when you can keep it simple, it's beautiful to keep it simple. Mike H is using an SE V7 microphone into a Mackie Pro FX 10 V3 mixing board. It's going line into a DMW XLR1 Panasonic, uh, which is the Panasonic uh, XLR audio adapter for the GH5 2, and then the output via HDMI from that to a CamLink 4K and OBS to Teams, Zoom, Facebook Live, etc. Very cool. Uh, Robert says that I should call my mic an ice cream stick mic. Um, much more tasty. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> uh, Alexi says, is using a DPA headset, a Shure ULX-D body pack. So the Shure um, ULX 
wireless system uh, into a Mixpre 6.2, a Sony A7S III, A10 Mini Pro, and then there for Zoom, WebEx, or Teams. Very good. Good setup there. All right. Did I miss any here? Zach is using a Cinco D2 shotgun microphone into a Zoom H6, into a Canon XA11, into an A10 Mini Pro, to a 2015 MacBook Pro, to YouTube or Zoom. Very good. Darren Land is using an SM58 and pod mics to a Rodecaster Pro 2 or Yamaha MG12UX to the ATEM Extreme. Cool. And then Mark is, uh, if I did live stream Mark Holloway, <laughs> a Nikon Z8 to an A10 Mini Pro to YouTube, Aston Spirit Mic to an Art Voice channel. I've always wanted to try that, by the way, Mark. I wonder what your experience is with that. Do you like it? Um, and then you go into a Mix Pre 3.2 and then out to camera. So you're, you're making sure your audio, you're, you're basically on a pretty much an analog signal chain until you get to your camera, which then converts the audio to digital, syncs it up, and sends it over to your A10 Mini Pro. Very good. All right. Matt Ruff says, running live sound for five decades, most of my career, uh, most of my world was live, so live doesn't scare me. That's because you have the experience. Um, for those of us that haven't done as much live, it's a nerve wracking at first. But again, like I said, once you once you get, dip your feet into that, it's it's really really helpful. Um, and yes, Matt, you'll have to teach all of us the ways. <laughs> uh, Christopher, for video, my camera is an NDI PTZ Bird Dog P uh, P4K that comes in directly to the computer via NDI. Very good. Emil says, I find it easier to EQ other voices than my voice. I can't quite be separate. Any negative bias I have about my voice and unmuddy the sound. Any tips when using the Rodecaster Duo? Yeah, Emil, I think for me, the biggest, doing it while you're talking for me is virtually impossible. Um, or until you're really experienced. But I, I find that what makes more sense is to make a recording. Put that in one of the sound pads if you're using a roadcaster, play it back, and then uh, can you apply? I don't know if you can do it that way. What I do is I put it on the computer in a digital audio workstation and make a recording. And then as I'm playing that recording back, I apply the EQ and the compressor, and I can then I can hear what it's doing without it, while I'm not talking. As you're talking, it's really hard while you're talking because that that sound energy that you're making is is reverberating or is, is, it's moving through your head, <laughs> and you're trying to listen at the same time. Often with a little bit of latency, even if there's not a lot of latency, it's disorienting. It's really hard. So I really find that I have to do a recording and play the recording back while I apply those. So or get someone else to to double check for you on the settings. Do your best um, as you are talking. And then, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's my advice there. All right. And then Michael J. also uh, cites some other microphones, an RE320, this is Electro Voice, RE320, RE20, Lawton Audio LA220, and Earthworks Icon Pro. Very good. Some nice microphones there as well. I do think the, the Earthworks Ethos is another really fantastic microphone. I, I love that microphone as well. That's the one we typically use when I'm streaming in the other room. Um, yeah, it just fits better on the the um, the low profile arm that I have set up on my desk there uh, versus the Jay-Z microphone. So when I'm in here, I'll often use the Jay-Z microphones. When I'm in there, I'll typically use the Earthworks Ethos just for practical reasons and based on the, the setup I have there. All right, everybody. It has been a lot of fun to spend part of this Sunday with you. I hope you um, are able to get out there and make some great sound this week. Uh, keep learning. Keep trying new things. Um, yeah, make some great sound. We'll talk to you again next week. Take care, everybody.